Okay, so we're not hearing. Hello, hi. So, Mary, do you have all your hours now? Well, if you're going to let me have that, yeah, but I don't feel like that's any volunteer stuff. Yeah, but stuff falls into education. You can continue to do it. Okay. okay. I'm just going to get toy with the sorry. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I was sort of confused with that, you know, between mm -hmm. volunteer that's zero. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I
and then we added plus points to it. But we're talking about um, fungus gnats. You know, so you've got a house plant. A lot of times you'll have fungus gnats, and those are those annoying little gnats that fly around your face. Well, the fungus gnats are attracted to the, the alcohols in your breath, the, the fermentation in your breath. And, and I don't mean that you, know, you just had a beer and now you got fungus gnats, but, but <laughs> just your breath, you're attracted to that. And it can be kind of daunting to get rid of, but the fungus gnats love overwatered house plants. And, the, and that overwatering creates a lot of algae in the soil. Now, those larvae feed on the algae. And so they're, they're in a happy place where they're, they're getting fed and they're getting water and it's warm and it's just a perfect environment for them. And so one female little fungus ant, well, she only might live five days. She can lay like 200 eggs. And, and even if 50% hatch or 10% hatch, that's still 10% too many, right? 20 is too many. So there are some great ways to get rid of them that are pretty harmless. I'm gonna pass these, these are yellow sticky tracks. And so they're bright yellow, and they are truly sticky. Yeah. So when you when you peel the back in, yeah, you, yeah. you you gotta kind of hold it there because it's a tangle foot is on there, and, and you will stick to this. Okay. <laughs> but you just pluck it down into your plant, and the fungus gnat adults are attracted to the color yellow. They love that color, and they will just kind of and stick to it. Which is very cool. Also, I got a little tea on it. It's why it's wet. It's nothing weird, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. You're, you're good. I appreciate you bringing those in so we could show them. I just couldn't believe that they worked this afternoon. I was this afternoon. It was like, yeah, okay. covered. Covered. The fungus yeah, nets. Not so, where did you get them? I got them off of Amazon. I think uh, I spent like, I don't know, eight bucks. And I got all of those. And yeah, oh, you got all like, right, yeah. Like yeah, you gotta love Amazon. Are you having these out for them? Yeah. Oh, oh, like one. One. I bought them <laughs> <laughs> my office so we would get all of our plants there. Yeah. 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 The other cat tried to jump past. <laughs> oh, oh no. my God. So I have a couple of those that have big patches of cat. <laughs> yeah, I'm too. Oh yeah, one year I had a cat decided that the the fly strip that that you unroll was was his new toy, and he came in to me and it was wrapped around his body. <laughs> We're talking a cat, right? <laughs> so you feel both sides, obviously. Yeah, so both sides are sticky. Yeah. So so the other trick is to get some Bacillus thuringiensis. Israeliensis BTI, and they come in like mosquito dunks, and you go on Amazon, buy them as little wafers, and throw them in your water can. And so every time you water, you add this BTI to your soil. That's coming in tomorrow. Yep. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and and so you get the you now you're going after the larva in the soil. So the, the other thing you can do, which is to me is a little more on the kind of creepy side but you can take a potato a raw potato cut it and put that raw potato on the soil and the larva will come up and attach themselves to the potato and then in the morning you just lift it up and try not to be grossed up and throw it away <laughs> so there's a couple ways to go after fungus gnats and house plants have you heard about using matchsticks my friend swore by it. Really? Yeah, she said it totally worked for her. I mean, I'm not convinced because I have like 15 matchsticks in my matches palm and it's still kind of dead and there's still gnats coming out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard that one before, but you know. All right, coming up with something. Yeah, after 19 years of working with master gardeners, I have long learned to to never say never, or you can't do that to a master gardener. <laughs> I really <laughs> usually get put in my place. Someone goes, I'm growing it. <laughs> okay, so tonight's class is on prairie ecology. And I, 
this is kind of an additional class or bonus class for the program because I, I think I'm the only one in the state that does this class. I live on the prairie. I live on several hundred acres. I'm very careful to manage it. I treat the prairie as, and I raise, I have cattle and I have sheep. And I treat it as I am I'm in the business of growing grass. And if I don't have that grass, I can't have the animals. And so there are certain times of the year where everybody gets pulled off the prairie and no one's allowed on there. And that makes my animals crazy because they can smell that new grass and they want it. So I've had to repair a fence quite frequently because they don't want to go through it. So the spring from, from March until almost the 4th of July, I try to keep my animals off. And we'll talk about why that's important. The prairie is very fragile. It's very easy to destroy it. It is extremely difficult and daunting, time consuming and expensive to bring it back. So part of the class tonight is to kind of bust some myths, explain why it's, it's fragile, how to take care of it, and if you have to restore, how to do that. So I'm gonna to try to cover a lot of territory in a short time. And the, the program, <laughs> The, uh, the PowerPoint was a kind of a joint effort between myself and um, another master gardener who's got her master's in range ecology. And so it's, I might skip around a little bit on it. But I also have two catalogs. And I, you guys are going, God, what's her love affair with catalogs, <laughs> right? But again, the information in here if you had to buy the information in these two catalogs, it would be really, really expensive. And these are free. Free is good. There is a, a tremendous amount of books out there on the prairie, and Frances has brought a couple of her books. But this talks, this goes into a fair amount of detail. It's got some beautiful pictures. I'm looking at Prairie Nursery. And you can buy them as seeds, or you can buy them as, whole, as plants already started. And if you've joined up with the native plant group with the master gardeners, they will teach you how to start seeds. And I had a couple of seed starting classes last year, kind of did them out of season, but for the most part, they're not that daunting to work with and get started. Some of them are a little more fussy. If someone tells me I want to grow ramps, I'm going to kind of go, oh, good luck. Their ramps take about two years. And, and they have to go through a, a freeze, they have to warm up, they have to refreeze, then they have to warm up, and then they'll think about germinating. So they're, you can grow them here, but they're, they're pretty persnickety. But these, these catalogs also have plants in here that they'll tell you if they attract what? Butterflies, bees, native bees, and we're a lot more concerned about our native bees than we are honeybees. European honeybees versus native bees. You know, I love I love honey, and I think that's an awesome product. And and then from the hive, there's the propolis and just a whole wealth of other things. I've had classes where the hive is your medicine chest, but our native bees are really the ones that are truly endangered, and those are the ones I would encourage you to plant for. But this is a great, both of these catalogs are great for helping you figure out what to plant, what works, how to grow it. And they tell you all about, you know, if it likes sun or partial sun, how much water it wants, when it blooms, how tall it's going to get, what zone it's in. And again, you want to go for plants that are at least zone four, maybe even zone three, but still look at their requirements for what they want. You can have a zone three plant that likes it acidic and moist. That is not us. So do take a look at it. Fun, uh, pretty fun, fun pictures. <laughs> Good dialogue in there. Okay. Press hard. <laughs>
I think you can see the screen a little bit better. Okay, so French trappers, French explorers were the first ones to really give the prairie its name, Artera or Meadow. And the trappers just looked at it and, and described it as a sea of grass. And so that's how it's got its name. Prairie is usually temperate climate, so it's gonna have seasons to it. Usually intercontinental, very rarely is it on a coastal area, and it's relatively flat. Some rolling areas, once you get into Nebraska and the Sand Hills area, it can be really rolling. There's areas in um, Kansas where it's like, wow. If you've ever been through um, on the west side of Kansas City on I-70 and the road goes down like this and then it goes straight up like that. And, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And then the Lowe's Hills over in Iowa. So there, it can be rolling, but as a rule, it's pretty flat. So some of the grasslands of the world, Central Africa is the savanna. Then you've got Southern Africa, the veld. Eurasia is the steppe. Australia is just the lowlands. South America, Pampas. And then they also have the Llanos. And to put that into a perspective, you can see that it's, it actually encompasses quite a bit, the prairie does. And in the United States up here, this continues to get a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. <laughs> so how was it created? The mountains, you know, we, in site analysis, we talked about rain shadows and, and how the, the moisture gets hung up in one area and then by the time it gets over the prairie, it's gone or it's very little or it's reduced. You know, it's like Laramie gets a lot more moisture than Cheyenne does. You know, over here, anywhere from nine to 15 inches, Laramie probably gets anywhere from on a bad year 10 up to up to about 16 inches. So they get a little bit more rain just because it gets hung up on the mountains. So we're in a shadow. So the prairie is usually in some sort of a rain shadow situation. Drought is very common. It's like here in Wyoming, all the West, I mean, we're always in a drought, right? We're never out of a drought. We just have good years and we have bad years, but we're always in some sort of a drought. So knowing that, should help you understand watering and usage of being on the prairie. And then of course, um, grasslands thrives and trees and shrubs really didn't do well here because either something ate them or, or there would be a periodic fire. And fire wasn't very frequent, but it did happen and it would take out the trees, but usually the trees were eaten. typically by these guys, or antelope, or deer. And again, short growing season. We, we all, we've discussed the growing season. It can be as short as 89 days. I've lived through 150 day growing season. So the growing season varies, but as a rule, it's short. And then the prairie is, is further divided into tall grass. And, and so tall grass, if you've ever been through the tall grass prairies in Kansas, six feet tall, not unusual. Yeah. I had a chance a number of years ago to ride a horse through the tall grass prairie. And it just kind of looked like a body floating on the grass because you couldn't see the horse anymore. Then there's a mixed grass or mid grass. And so that, that's a grass that gets maybe three to four feet. And then there's some low growing stuff in there. So there's a, a mix of both in there. And then short grass. And so we really kind of fall into that mixed or mid grass area. And I've seen the prairie, you know, after a good spring, good winter, I've seen the grasses out there come up to my waist. So about three and a half feet. Don't have that very often, but that's kind of how it should, how it should be. So this is how the prairie is further divided. And so the red area is your tall grass area that's gonna be a little bit farther back east, a little bit more moisture, a little bit more rain. And then the mixed grass and then the short grass. And so we're kind of like right in that area.
So here's kind of like the sad news. Less than 1% of the tall grass prairie remains. And now they've got like little wildlife or refuge areas for the, the tall grass prairie. And they're, they're doing a lot of work back in Kansas to try to restore it and bring it back into a little bit bigger areas. And then in Illinois, there's that, that science, it's a, the accelerator in, in Illinois, but it's this big circle thing, it's huge. And in the middle of it, they have a tall grass prairie. So it's pretty, that's pretty interesting, but it's, it's contained by giant walls. 24% of the mixed grass prairie is intact and then about 18% of the short grass prairie is attacked. So it's, it, it gets smaller every year, it gets smaller. So rangeland, when you look out on the prairie and you walk the prairie, it should be completely covered with something. There, there's gonna be a few bare spots here and there, but you shouldn't walk out on it and and there's a patch of grass and then dirt, a patch of grass and dirt. There should be, it should be completely covered. So you're gonna have a diversity of plant life there. You're gonna have um, small growing plants. You're gonna have grass, you have cool season. You'll have a little bit of warm season grass in there. You'll have, um, oh, prickly pear in there, you'll have all sorts of things. You'll have a good diversity of plants and that's what you want. And that helps hold that soil structure together because once you start losing that and the wind just picks that soil up and it, it takes it to someone else's front door, through their window, in my window. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's kind of magical how that moves around, not in a good way. So we do have some mixed grass prairie in the western part of the county, so a little bit higher up. Mostly short grass throughout the rest of our county. And some tall grass prairies in the wetter areas. And I did find some tall grass prairie down in Fort Collins. And it, it's just a tiny thing. It probably takes up about as much space as this room if it's still left. But just a little bit of tall grass prairie down in Fort Collins northeast area, but just very tiny patches of it anymore. Okay, so the grasses, prairie grasses, and this is how they're gonna differ from, from, from lawn grass. And so a lot of times when people move from in town to out in the county, they take their, their in town concepts of grass with them. And it's like, well, I mow my, my bluegrass lawn every week and I'm gonna mow my prairie every week. You can't do that out there because the bluegrass lawn is highly cultivated. It's fertilized, it's watered, it's manicured, it's maintained, it's pampered. And so on the prairie, you don't have that. And so we in the prairie, you're gonna find primarily two different types of grass. One is gonna be a bunch grass, and the other one is going to be a sod former. So the sod formers, think of um, bluegrass lawn sod formers, and then you've got the bunch grass. And so they'll form kind of a mass and, and almost kind of a mound, something that you can trip over. And then the root system goes way down. So, so in the prairie, you know, this, if this is a bunch grass, This, even on your side formers, so the side formers are kind of going along like this, but they should also be putting down just amazing roots. Six feet deep, not unusual. Yeah. But the bunch grass, you'll know a bunch grass when you see it because it's just this clump. And if you're not looking for it, you will trip over it. <laughs> So we have cool season grasses and then we have warm season or hot season grasses. So they're, they're called C3 grasses or cool season grasses. So these ones up here, as they get taller,
these are the ones that are going to come out of dormancy. Well, they should be coming out in a couple of weeks, actually. They'll start to green up. And you're going to just see little bits of green at the base. They'll stay, they will stay green and they'll continue to grow until about mid-May. And so this is something that just really surprises everybody. But these cool season grasses, they're going to start to put up a seed stalk. And so they'll put this seed up and they'll have their leaves. And as soon as they start to put up that seed stalk, the leaves, this stops growing. And so by mid-May, to 1st of June, depending upon the year and our moisture, what you see is all that you're going to get. So it stops growing once it starts putting up that seed head, it starts putting more effort and energy into that seed itself. The blades pretty much stop growing. And so what you see is what you're gonna get for the rest of the year. And so I have, I see people go out there and mow it and mow it and mow it and it's just so incredibly damaging. So the other grass is called C4 or, you know, it, it comes out of dormancy, it likes the heat, it likes it hot. And so this is, and then it goes dormant when it gets cool up. So this is your buffalo grass. And we talked a little bit about buffalo grass in, our, in the turf class. This only gets a couple inches tall. Puts on kind of a fun little seed head. And so it's gonna be brown most of the time with a brief period of green up. Very low maintenance. I mean, if you want that, that Zarek yard where you don't have to put any water or minimum water to it, buffalo grass and blue grandma are your grasses to grow for that. Um, usually when I come out and do a, a prairie call and all I see is buffalo grass, I know that it's been either overgrazed or over mowed because these guys die out very quickly when they're, when they're overly abused. And about 75% of that grass, you know, an unmolested prairie, this is 75% down here. Of the biomass is below ground. It's wind pollinated. So when you get that hay fever, it's usually the pollen coming off of grasses. Wind pollinated. Catherine? Yes. Um, this is Susie. I just had a question. Um, we put down some dry land pasture mix that you get from um, uh, Murdoch's. What what kind of grass is that? It's like a rye grass blend. So what kind is that a C3 or a C4 or what do you think? That's going to be your cool season grasses. And, and so you're you know, they've got a list on the side, kind of an ingredient list, if you will, but they'll have a list of everything that's in there. And they're probably gonna have some, um, some brome, some smooth brome in there, which is not a native grass. It's incredibly evasive, forms a dense mat, just, I mean, like a spongy mat. It's about 18 inches deep. You can't even get a shovel in it. So you gotta be really careful with that. When did you plant it? Uh, we put it down um, last summer. We we are on land that had um, new construction done on it. And so you had to put some grass in within a certain amount of time period. And that was the one that was recommended by the HOA. Okay, not, not what I would, not what I would recommend, but okay. That's the HOA doesn't, anyway. Um, did anything come up? Did anything germinate? Yes, um, when we first put it down, um, it germinated within two weeks. We had to pretty much keep it constantly wet in order for that to occur. Um, we know that uh, bare spots have happened though. We, ha we have antelope, we have birds and all kinds of stuff that seems to eat it. But um, 
so we're looking at what we need to kind of reseed with the lawn with this year. So we were thinking we would just do the same one, but um, sounds like we shouldn't do that. We should go for a bag of, of what? Of yeah. Buffalo? Well, no, don't, don't put Buffalo down. Okay. Um, not, not for the prairie. That'll come in all on its own. I, and I'll cover that through the class. My, I suspect that it was the rye that came up right away. So don't be surprised if you have to reseed. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so, so this is one of those things that I, that's hard to battle is the HOAs. And, you know, I don't know, I, for life of me, I don't know where they get their information. And then there's some HOAs that were, um, the covenants were created by people from back in California, which have an incredibly different growing season and different grass. California, have you, you know, how many of you been to California? Okay, you know why it's called the Golden State? It's because their grass goes dormant really early and it turns gold. I mean, literally gold colored. And so that's how it got the name, the Golden State. Had nothing to do with gold, the gold rush. <laughs> Had everything to do with the grass, and and so they there's some whole HOAs for they've written their covenants based on California, and and so the worst thing you can do to your prairie is mow it. And there's a lot of myths about that, and and those all those myths come from from in town homeowners that oh you got to mow the prairie because otherwise it's a fire hazard, and I and that's about the farthest from the truth as you can get. The research done by all the major universities, whether it's Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, I mean, name your university, they're all gonna tell you that when you mow this prairie, you are, the prairie grass, the, your C3s, these guys immediately go into dormancy. They immediately turn brown and they're not coming back. They're, they're you, you, shocked them into dormancy and you're not going to see them again until next year. So the more you mow and we'll let's see if I can find that. Okay. So the more you mow, the more of this biomass you lose. So the roots, the roots are the biomass. And so you mow this down and You're gonna, so you've just come through and you, you've mowed it like this. Well, believe it or not, the roots go away. So I, this is kind of one of those kind of weird concepts that it's like, well, why would the, why would the roots die? You just cut off all this biomass on the top, and now they don't need all those roots. And so, so now you have 50% less roots. So it, it takes energy for those roots to keep the plant alive. Well, meanwhile, it's not getting photosynthesis from the leaves. Right. So keep them, you know, remember these little leaves here are, are factories photosynthetic factories that are sending energy down to the roots. They just lost a lot of energy. And now this, these grass is trying like heck to, to refeed the roots. And, and so this, when you cut that, you lose about 20% of the energy stored in these roots. And so the more you mow this, you just come by and you go, oh, it's, it's a week later, I need to mow again. Well, you just again lost more roots because you keep taking away the leaves, which are, are creating all the energy, they're photosynthesizing, they're sending, sending all those stored carbohydrates down to the roots. Well, now you have less roots, less blade. Less, less blade is working and less blade is sending energy down. And so, you eventually lose that grass 
And now your buffalo, now weeds are gonna come in, a whole bunch of critters. If, if, so this is what I, I, I warn people when I go out and I do yard calls on the prairie, it's like I shoot from the hip and I don't take any prisoners. And I'm gonna be really black and white and you're gonna know right where you stand. But I warn everybody, you know, I should have a little warning label on my forehead. <laughs> if you want prairie dogs, 13 striped squirrels, brown squirrels, if you want rabbits, if you want more coyotes, if you want weeds, and when you end up with creatures that form holes in the ground, you're gonna have more snakes. You're gonna have black widow spiders for sure, bundle spiders. And, and the weeds are gonna be very daunting because the grass, is, the grass can outcompete the weeds if the grass is healthy. When you've done this to it, it's not healthy and it can't outcompete it. So if you want all of that stuff, if you want prairie dogs, ground squirrels, if you want the gophers, if you want all of the snakes, the spiders, weeds, soil erosion, hotter, drier prairie, then by all means, mow it. Go ahead and mow it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm kind of the in-between because I work with the Department of Insurance. People ask me what to do when they're up in the prairie. So we're like defensible space. So we're taking a, well, I, I'd like to be at least be able to go, hey, this is something to take into consideration when you're thinking about decimating the prairie behind your house. So I'm trying to find that happy medium that I can help sure. homeowners and not have their house break. Sure. And and the whole the whole fear of the prairie burning down is is just a lot of a lot of myth. Like, well, I've watched the prairie burn and it's pretty exciting. And and I need to go out and burn weeds along the creek. And and that means my husband with a propane flamethrower. <laughs> no offense, guys, but once someone puts a propane flamethrower in your hands, you become a different creature. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, it's like giving him a rototiller. Do you need to meet this poor man? <laughs> so when you mow your prairie like that, you make it hotter and drier. And it is a fire hazard. And then you've got the little buffalo grass in there that's only like this. That's that's a lot of biomass right there that just it's a running fire. And it's a it's a fire that will go about four miles an hour. And, and that doesn't sound like much. Yeah, it sounds very good. You try how many of you can run four miles an hour? Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay, I can. Yeah. <laughs> All right, some of the younger people can, and I can't. Well, <laughs> <I'll laughs> <be with those laughs> but and so when you mow that prairie, you make it hotter and drier, and then you create that fire hazard. You can go out onto my prairie in the middle of August, and you can still find green grass. You're going to see that tall stuff, but you're still going to find green grass, and the, the soil underneath all it is still going to have moisture to it. But when you remove this, this dries out and becomes dry. And, and this grass can't survive in that dry soil. You know, you've lost your soil microbiology. So now there's nothing in there to help that plant. So it's kind of almost a sterile soil. You know, you can, you're welcome to jump in on this argument. This has been my, my platform on my soapbox for 18 years. <laughs> so the more it's mowed, the more problems you're gonna have. And so defensible space. I tell people to mow around your fence line, like, like five feet off the fence line. And part of it is because if the neighbors have horses and the neighbors have let their, path, their horses graze their pasture down to a, you know, dirt, and I've got some pictures of that, then the horses are gonna lean over that fence and, and bend the fence, break the fence. So mow along the fence, mow those weeds, whatever is along the fence. Mow around your house, keep your, have grass, have grass around the house. But leave the prairie alone. Because if the more, again, the more you mow it, you will have a fire hazard mowing it. And people look at that and they've seen pictures, you know, with the flame leaping up. I guarantee you, once that grass, once that fire hits a moist area with green grass, it's going to put itself up. So the flame one isn't going to be that high on the short, on the short part. It's like, yeah. Uh, the grass. Blue grandma. Yeah. It's almost the same thing as buffalo grass. Yeah. The sea dogs aren't really going to carry mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, but it's going to be a running fire. 
fire. And it'll be, yeah, unless there's a 100 mile an hour wind. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that up there. But yeah, the more you mow, the more problems you're going to have. Even driving on it, we felt we couldn't, we couldn't even drive. Yeah, across maybe twice. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fragile. The prairie is incredibly fragile. So Catherine, in devil's advocate, what if you waited until fall, just before winter, and then you did some, some more? Okay, so that tall grass helps hold the snow. Mm -hmm. And it helps prevent and reduce snow drifting. So if you if you want to drift your driveway in, mow. <laughs> want to drift the neighbors in, by all means, mow. You know, I've actually had a few people ask me about that one. I want to drift my neighbors in. Um, it, it's interesting out the prairie. But and so if you if you mow in the spring. You know, this grass is trying to grow. And, and once it starts to put that seed head out, it, the blades stop growing. And then the seed head, it puts all the energy into putting up a seed head. And that's, granted, that seed head can get pretty tall, but it helps hold the snow. And then, and then in the winter and the spring, and it eventually it falls over and it protects the ground. It acts as a ground cover. So it helps shade the ground and helps hold that moisture in. And so the longer you can keep your soil cool and moist throughout the growing season, the healthier prairie you'll have and you'll have a reduced fire hazard. The other thing from March until about the 4th of July is bird nesting season. And so we have, I think there's like 20 some species of birds that nest on the ground from the prairie, and that includes a hawk. There's a raptor that's on the ground. You've got your meadow lark, which is our state bird, lark buntings, killdeer. And the, no the northern goshawk. Yeah, the northern goshawk. Um, horned larks, lark buntings, morning doves. Morning doves. So there, there's a whole group of birds that nest in the prairie. So if you mow your prairie anytime from March through the 4th of July, I guarantee you, you are running over bird's nests. And I've had people go, well, I don't see them. You're not supposed to see them. I said, when, I, when I do a prairie call, I, I don't take prisoners on this one because the myth that goes with people out to the prairie is so counterproductive. And, and if you destroy your prairie or you get it down to where it's buffalo and grandma grass and you want to bring it back, that's years, years in the making. And you'll be fighting weeds, you'll be fighting soil erosion. And you know, so if we go back to the soils class, the soil amendment class, and even um, Brian's soil class, that bare soil, there's, there's very little to no soil micro biology going on in there. It needs that plant. It needs plants and it needs organic material. It needs, it needs some hummus in there. So it, humus. Decided that what what we would need as Park Service, you know, is is managing imperfect food, so we got all the time in the world. Uh, um, to start with, the grasses that were the um, like uh, sand drop seed, the early successional stages, because you can't go into a soil that's been destroyed, right, or or managed, or you take it out of the uh, Grass line and try to put it into prairie grasses. You got to start with the early successional stages and then go back maybe five years later and add other species in. 
some people say you can't you can't seem into a existing area because the the competition of the established grasses. But um, I don't know. I just thought I we would try that um, because some of the grasses you don't see. If you, even if you do see them in that first seeding, you don't see them come up for uh, we've had them like eight years, yeah. and then all of a sudden, yeah, you see all you know these plants that you planted eight years. Yeah, and that's why when Susan says you know that mix had lye in it, I, I'm betting that was what came up first. Just yeah, lye. and that's probably what the HOA is once or fast cover. Yeah, I don't care what it is. It's right, fast cover. And, no and here in Wyoming, lye grass doesn't grow very well. I mean, it's it's more of an annual than it is a perennial here. So, so it's, it's a, yeah. there there are uh, uh, some species that are what do you call it when you don't use. They're 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 made to be for the first year, and then they go to the back. Right, they're just an annual. Yeah, June grass is an annual. June grass is fun. That's a really pretty little thing. But it reproduces. I mean, it'll it'll. It just self seeds. Self seeds. Yep. Yep. But this is a. Yep. So anyway, you can see on the on this chart, you know, if you if you've taken fifty percent off, you're going to lose two to four percent of your roots. But if you keep taking fifty percent off. Pretty soon you're going to have 100% loss of that grass, and then and then more undesirable things move in. I did a yard call, prairie call, on 40 acres, and the lady had 40 horses that she had rescued, and she had them on these 40 acres, and it was it prairie there was just totally destroyed, and the guy that had lived that bought the property had lived there for three years already. And we went out there and it was still just a weed patch. And so trying to restore that is really, really hard. And like Francis was saying, you really can't use a mix of cool season and warm season grasses. They just don't, they're not compatible. They have two different requirements. And the and believe it or not, the warm season grass actually needs a lot of water. Buffalo grass needs a lot of water to get it to going apart. It's just that seed capsule that it's in. So you want to start off with your cool season grasses because those are the most likely to start going. But it's still going to be an uphill fight, an uphill battle. Long term, Francis was saying they were still working at it eight years later. And, and yeah, I've got some areas on my prairie where it had been um, part of my, my property was part of the whole Texas trail. And so they would trail cat, you know, back in before the train, they were herding cattle up from Texas up to Pine Bluffs and then out to out east. And then the train came in. And so they would trail them up to Pine Bluffs, which was a giant feed yard. But they would graze everywhere because I have Crow Creek running through my property. It was it was perfect. So it had grass, it had water, it had everything that was needed, and then they drive them over to Pine Bluffs. And so for 150, 175 years or more, 200 years, you know that prairie was pretty abused. And and then the previous owners there raised cattle, and there was a group that raised horses. And so there, I have a whole area that's just not coming back and I've seeded and I'll reseed, but it's it's a long uphill battle trying to restore your prairie. Did you say start with cool season? Yeah. Yep. I, I, I would say predominantly cool season grasses in that first mix and much less of the warm season grasses because they're going to eventually catch up to the cool season grasses. Yep. And the cool season grasses, if you get them to come up, will compete better with the weeds because weeds are always, always the first thing that comes up. Yep. Kosha. Russian thistle, buffalo burr. And if you can. Oh God, I'm fighting buffalo burr on my property. Oh, that, that'll make you. <coughs> okay. 
So this is kind of my soapbox lecture all night. Sorry about that. Um, stocking rates. Yeah, so there's down in Colorado, there's a number of really good companies to go to to buy seed from. <coughs> so one of them is Pawnee Butte Seeds. And another one Francis has talked about where they've worked with the Colorado Native Plant Society. And so they've got a lot. They have a really nice wildflower mix and a really nice pasture mix. And then there's uh, Sharp Brothers Seed. And again, they've got a really good pasture mix. Arkansas Valley Seed. Um, Applewood Seed Company. So if you don't need to seed a lot, um, Applewood is a good place to go and you can buy all sorts of really cool wildflower <laughs> seeds. The seeding rate is around 12 to 15 pounds per acre. When you start getting into your warm season grass seed, like your buffalo grass and your blue grandma, the price per pound is breathtaking. Mm -hmm. Breathtaking. <laughs> a couple years ago, it was just $16, $17 a pound. I'm hearing $40 a pound, and I've heard up to, up to $80 a pound. That you cannot afford to mess up with that with seed that's that expensive. And so if you want to do buffalo grass, buy it as plugs and put it in as plugs. And if you're going to do that, then, then look at doing it for your lawn. Because the seed take, it'll take three years to go in. Yep. To seed it. And it's got to have moisture. Buffalo grass comes in a, in a capsule, and within that capsule are several seeds. And so that capsule has got to break down, and then the seed coat's got to break down. And so it, it takes a lot of moisture to do it, but it wants warm. It wants warm soil, 75 degrees or better. That is really, really hard to achieve. Buffalo grass, once it gets going, is a really good sod former, if you can call it that. And, and it will cover a lot of ground pretty quickly. And of all things out of my place, I've got muta grass growing, which... I'm okay with because it holds the soil and it can handle the sheep eating it to the nubs and it comes back. It, it's pretty amazing. So stocking rates. This is also called animal units. And an animal unit is a cow-calf pair or one horse or a couple of sheep or a couple of goats. And, and this changes. And I, I, and I hear all sorts of crazy things and the realtors like to go, oh, well, it's, you know, you can have one horse per 10 acres. No, you can't. You can't. They, they don't know where they're getting, sorry, they don't know where they're getting those numbers. I, I don't know where they're getting that number either. But it, it changes. So trying to really pin that down is hard. You don't want to graze in the spring if you can avoid it. I hold my animals off. I try not to let them go out until at least the latter part of June. Part of it is because this grass is trying to grow. And if I let them out there, it's equivalent to mowing. And they're just going to eat that seed head off. Then that plant's got to try to regrow that seed head. And so every time it does that, it's 20% energy that pulls out of its root system to make that seed head. So it's a huge cost. And grazing in the spring is really hard on the, on the grass, not to mention all your native birds are out there trying to nest. You know, you've got wildflowers trying to come in. And so this is really a very pivotal time on the prairie where it's trying to maintain itself. And this is when you don't want to graze. But if you do, your grazing length is going to be four to five days on 40 acres. For one? For one animal unit. Yep. So if you've got a couple of horses, you're going to let them out for a couple hours a day and then bring them back in. So if they're out there for, you know, you come home in the evening, you let them out, let them graze, put them back in at night. And, it's, and if you've got to let them graze, it's better to let them graze at night than during the day. They actually graze less at night. 
So let them out during the couple hours in the evening, put them back in and, or, or just put this, there's been a number of times where I've looked at the people and go, just put a saddle on him and go ride him a little bit more. Cause you know, that's like, I got someone shot back and he goes, well, it's cruel to keep your horse in a corral. No, it's not. <laughs> they can do it, put a saddle on him and take him for a ride, <laughs> you know, go exercise him. So horses can tolerate small confined areas. I have a sacrificial area that's about 100 by 150. And, and when I had a horse, that's where he got to stay. And then I just let him out a little bit or I'd go ride him. So summer, you can graze a little bit longer because this has stopped growing. Let's put up a seed head. Now you're dealing more with your warm season grasses, which are, again, are just really short. So there you can graze nine to 10 days without hurting the prairie. And so this is all based on not hurting the prairie. Regrowth period, if there's moisture, if there's moisture, it may take the prairie to grow back another month. When we have a three to four month growing season, that's not a lot of time for that grass to recover. Late summer, your grazing periods are 12 to 15 days, so up to two weeks. Again, my advice is to let them out in the evening or let them out in the morning before you go to work or after you come home or let them out on the weekends, bring them back in, but don't, don't sacrifice that prairie. And any more, that land is more valuable than your horse, unless you've got a $100,000 horse, and then you're gonna be really protective of them anyway, and they're probably not gonna be out loose on the prairie. So that gives you an idea. And even with a cow and a calf or um, sheep or goats, and, and goats are a different grazing creature. Does anyone ever have goats here? Oh, I don't see any goats. I want to have goats. Goats are landscape piranhas. <laughs> they will strip the bark off a tree faster than you can go oh, and run out there. And, <laughs> and they'll take a rose bush down to the ground, thorns and all. See that especially when trying to rinse out the filters. Yep. Oh yeah. Bob Bob Lee's always telling me about having to replace somebody's rose bush or tree or something because the goats ate it. Yeah. Can you just have your tenants like if there's an area since you've got very land, you've got an area that's been kind of destroyed like, can you use goats to like knock all those weeds down? It's try to restart things or? Okay, yes, maybe. <laughs> so I used to raise goats. I had four, I, I've had four goats, which are meat goats. I've had angora goats and I've had dairy goats. So when I say they're landscape piranhas, it's from personal experience. They'll eat a pine tree down just so fast. You just, it, it's, you swear there was a beaver out there or someone with a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> you just you love them and you hate them. You know, all the, they're browsers, okay? They're not grazers, and so a goat will eat what's what they're what's at eye level, and then what's not at eye level, they'll they'll climb or, or they'll stand up on their back feet to get up into your tree or something, and and so they they prefer things here. <clears throat> if they've been taught or trained to eat the weeds, they'll eat them, but if they haven't, they'll they'll leave them alone. My goats would eat the flowers and the leaves off of tumble mustard and just leave the stalk. Mm -hmm. You know, which eight flowers, eight seeds, that's okay. And because they've got a complex stomach system, they pretty well digest those seeds. You know, when you're talking a horse uh, or um, chickens or those kind of creatures, horse is horrible because they don't have a true, a really decent digestive system. They have a, a stomach that's just sort of part of their intestinal tract, so it's not, not really a true stomach. So just what goes in goes out. And so the seeds have kind of gone through a stratification and then they're in moist fertilized soil. So yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. You can, and Bob, Bob Lee with the city, has got his goats eating the spurge and, and it helps. And then he's put grass seed down over, over 
30 years, he's put grass seed down to come in and out try to outcompete Spurge. But Spurge is a real tough customer. That's difficult. But but you can you can do that. I I don't know why they don't use goats up in the Bighorn Basin along the river to take care of the Russian olives because goats and eat the trees <laughs> solve a lot of problems. So it kind of gives you an idea of what the land will support. I've been through droughts out here where you couldn't put a number, an acreage number to the animal. So I've seen it where it takes 100 acres to support one animal. And out here, we always talk about acres per animal. Back east, they talk about animals per acre. And so I've got some friends back in Indiana and Ohio, and they're like, yeah, I've got, got 15 sheep on an acre and they can't keep up with the grass. And I'm like, I, I have one sheep on 15 acres. How's that? <laughs> Okay, so this is this is out by me. Forty horses on five acres, raised it to the dirt, and then they ate the grass roots and all. Some surface grazing. Yeah, I worked for the agronomist to call that subsurface grazing. Yeah, yeah. They ate the roots and everything. They yeah, so because horses have got an upper and a lower teeth, where goats and sheep and cattle have a grazing pallet, and so they can't pull the whole grass out of the ground, but a horse will pull the grass out roots and all, and they'll eat the roots. And so horse, how many horse owners do I have in here? I have one person brave enough to now admit that they've got horses. <laughs> so when this happens, now the horse is grubbing around on, on the soil, and they're, they're, they're pulling all this sand up, you know, because they're bored, they're eating them. So now the horse owner should be just terrified of sand calling. Mm -hmm. Either an expensive vet bill, trip to CSU, or a dead horse. Sometimes all three in the row. <laughs> that's, that's just not a good thing. But you can see where they've grazed it so hard, they've actually turned the fence over trying to eat the neighbor's pasture. And so this is why I say mow along your fence line if your neighbors have horses, so the neighbor's horses don't do this. Because then you're going to have to go back to the neighbor and say, uh, you need to fix the fence between our land. And there, there, there's been a lot of fights over that one. It's like, you fix it. You don't like it, you fix it. Okay, and then back to what you were talking about. You can see there's no snow in this area. You can see on the yucca with the snow. And then if you look really carefully in here, you can see that there's snow in the grass. And so that grass is holding the snow, but all the snow is just going to blow off here. And, and now it's in that prairie, which is to the advantage of that, that neighbor. Because now they got all your moisture. <laughs> okay, so we've been talking about the grasses, and we've kind of mentioned some of these names, but a short grass prairie is predominantly your blue grandma and your buffalo grass. And again, these are really short, like two inches. The seed head can get like eight inches tall. But when this, when this dries out and catches on fire, it's a running fire, four miles an hour. Doesn't sound fast, but I can't unrun, I can't, I can run that fast, but I can't. And, uh, and so it can go really, really quickly. It doesn't get, the flames don't get very high at all, but it's just, it's just fast. So blue grandma, beautiful grass. Like the seed heads are like little eyelashes. And so the horticulture industry has gotten a hold of this grass and they have hybridized it and they've turned it into an ornamental grass. And so you can buy this, it comes as a bunch of grass. And it comes in different heights and it adds a lot of interest to your garden. You know, if you're doing kind of a native garden, uh, beautiful grass to add and very tough, very durable, but it, it's only going to green up when it's warming. And your buffalo grass. So this is both a male and a female plant in here. And, and so this is the seed. It's a little bulb there, another little bulb there. So it's a capsule. 
doesn't get very tall, pretty tough. Won't take a lot of traffic, you know, foot traffic. If you're in town, you want a Zurich yard where you don't have to do a lot of water because in town your water's getting expensive. You can certainly try to do a buffalo grass. Does not like shade. It wants the full sun. Likes it hot. Likes it hot. So if your yard is at all shady, it won't work. So then you've got the mixed prairie grass and these are your cool season grasses. And this is just sort of the tip of the iceberg on the different types of prairie grasses that you can have out there. Western wheatgrass, the one that I've got highlighted is now the official state grass of Wyoming. Yes, we have an official state grass. It's actually a very pretty grass. It's got a blue green hue to it, kind of almost a teal a blue teal color is a rhizominous grass. So it creeps underground, it forms a sod. And you can definitely make a sod out of it. It's very, it's very pretty. Needle and thread grass. For any of you who've grown up out on the prairie and had brothers, siblings, this is, this is the grass you pull and you throw at your brother and impale him on this. Sandbird bluegrass, um, needle left sedge, June grass, Indian rice grass. So Indian rice grass is also another really, really cool grass. But this is needle and thread. And can you see these little curly few things? Well, you pull that out, and that seed head has got it's it's like a needle. It's like a hypodermic needle. Has anyone grown up with needle and thread grass? Oh, you know what I'm talking about. It gets stuck in my dogs. Yeah, it gets stuck in my in my sheep and yeah. It's very painful. What's the little neck on the end of the seed? Oh, the hall? Yeah, it corkscrews the corkscrews the seed that it's just around the hall. Yeah, as it dries and it's like corkscrews it into my the wool of my sheep and, mm -hmm. and people with dogs, golden retrievers, that sort of thing. But it is a pretty good. It is pretty. You can pull this little corkscrewy seed thing out and you throw it your sibling. <laughs> and it's sharp. It's like it's it is like almost needle sharp. Like a, God. Okay, don't work. No work now. Uh, okay, Western Western wheatgrass. This is the seed head. Not very exciting. It is a beautiful grass, and it's worth cultivating if you find it in your in town yard. Sandberg bluegrass. So this kind of gives. You, so trying to identify grasses is brain damaging. And, and when someone brings me in, you know, they pulled out some grass in the prairie and they bring, can you identify this? I'm like going, I have a meeting I have to go to. <laughs> I'm going, no. The, the books on it is, it, it's hard to identify. It's a little easier when they put up the, the, the grass, the seeds, but otherwise before that it is just really, really difficult. Very time consuming, very tedious and time consuming to try to identify it. Sedge, so kind of a way to remember sedges is they have edges. So when you feel that grass, there'll be an edge to it. Yeah, there's more to that than leaf. And then they have a little kind of a bald type seed head on them. So they're actually pretty easy to identify. As long as they have the seed head on Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes you can, you know, get down on there and feel it. And, um, prairie June grass. This is this is beautiful. Picture doesn't do it justice. When it's when it turns ripe, it, it's a gold color and it just glows. It is beautiful. Indian rice grass. There was someone here in Wyoming, Wheatland, Torrington area, that had put in a whole field or tried to put in a whole field of Indian rice grass. And he was going to cultivate it and um, harvest it and use it for uh, an alternative flower. I 
Yeah, I never heard if he was successful with it or not. But that's a pretty grass. I love that seed head on that. Okay, so we're gonna jump to water. There's not a lot of us that live out on the prairie. If you do move out to the prairie and there's an irrigation ditch going through your property or a creek or any sort of water, that water belongs to the state. And so irrigation ditch runs through your property, the water belongs to the end user and the water in the ditch still belongs to the state, but you can't touch it unless you get it appropriated and you get in, go into the state engineer's office and try to get a permit for it. And that will be an uphill battle because now you're gonna to have to fight with everybody else on the creek on that irrigation ditch to try to get the water. Does anyone out here live with an irrigation ditch or water running through the property? There, there's a reason that the saying, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Because, yeah. Yeah, so all, all water is owned by the state and must be permitted for use. So if it runs through your property, I guarantee you someone's got a permit on it somewhere down the line. And trying to get any sort of irrigation water is really, really daunting. Yeah. Are we allowed to collect rainwater? Yes, you can, you can now collect rainwater. For a long time, you couldn't, but they've changed that law and you can now collect your rainwater. Yep. City water, Wyoming, Cheyenne City water, is that groundwater? Where does it come from? That's complicated. <laughs> it's very complicated because it, it actually comes from Rob Roy Reservoir, which is over in um, Albany County. And they pipe it over. And then there's a bunch of wells up on the Belvoir and a couple of the reservoirs, Crystal and Granite are all reservoirs for the city of Cheyenne. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if water crosses your land, it's, it's don't assume you can use it. Back East, like Virginia, and those places where it's kind of oozing out of the ground, Tennessee, Kentucky, ditch runs to your property, it's, it's kind of, you can use that water typically, ask first, but out in the West, water is so precious that it's a, it's, it's a fighting issue. Is it over appropriated? Oh, yes. Same thing in Colorado, very over appropriated. Yep. So this is just a, a rig, a, a, a well drigging rig. Those of us who live out in the county and have a well, the only time your well pump will go out, this is during a major holiday in the winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So groundwater, domestic and stock wells limited to 25 gallons per minute. And so this is, I don't know, they don't enforce this. Domestic use is defined as water for household for three or less single family dwellings, non-commercial garden, landscape, water, no more than one acre. So you can try to irrigate a full acre. Uh, commercial use, greenhouses, businesses, um, additional permitting requirements. So well construction, you know, in a perfect world, you know, 20 feet from your property line, I'd want it a lot farther inside the property, at least 100 feet from a leach field. And that's why 20 feet from a property line gets a little questionable because you don't know where your neighbor's leach field is. <coughs> so it's best to know where your leach field is and then put your well in an appropriate place. And there are places here in Laramie County where there's, there is no groundwater. And so you've got you've to ask a lot of questions and you best to call the state engineer's office. And that should be the first question you ask is, is what is the water situation here? And if you're, and, and so do I have any real estate agents in here? No one that wants to know, okay. Um, 
So real, here in Wyoming, real estate agents, we don't multi-list. And a real estate agent represents the seller. And so as the buyer, you have to do your own due diligence. So that means call the state engineer's office and find out what the water situation is on that land. Don't, don't assume that you've got water. Find out how, if there's a well, find out how deep it is. The state engineer's office, they are wonderful people to work with and they will help you just as much as they possibly can. They're really good people. Um, yeah, state engineer's office, they have the groundwater division and they have a surface water division, but they, they will really help you as much as they can. That's that's been that's been interesting because there's been a number of there was a permit put in last year for a high capacity well and it was strictly for use to sell water to frackers to fracking and it was pretty controversial went to the state engineer's office and I still haven't it's like been four months five months I still haven't we haven't heard word. I haven't heard word on what it's what the verdict was on it. I hope they turn it down. I really do. So high capacity wells, and that includes agricultural wells. They haven't permitted those since the 70s. And and they and the water is going down. The well, the groundwater has been going down, and they monitor that. The state engineer's office monitors that. And then the USGS, uh, the Geological Service monitors that. They, the USGS is, they're pretty, um, that's a pretty amazing group because not only do they monitor, but they test it for certain chemicals for um, herbicides and pesticides. <clears throat> so they monitor it. And they know that, that the groundwater has been going down steadily and quite, quite dramatic. And then I just read an article where um, some study came out, and I, I don't know who did the study, but it was um, suggested it would take about 150 years for that groundwater to come back to original levels. But we keep putting more wells in, more domestic wells. And yeah, the more the city grows and the county grows, the more we'll be tapping into that. And so that's, it is a tough one. It's, that's just really, you know, it's like if you want to open Pandora's box, groundwater is, and surface water is really going to spring that one open. And it's, it's just not fun. It's not fun. Um, wells, on wells. Do get your well tested for um, fecal chloroform. You can get a sample. Um, you can get a jar from the lab, which is actually just up the road here, the state lab, and they'll give you a jar, fill it, put the lid on it right away, take it into them right away, and it's free. And they're just checking, checking for fecal chloroform. You can do that twice a year. You know, if you test positive, you just take like a cup of bleach, you open up the top of your wellhead, dump it down in there. That's the consolidated yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right up the road. It's a beautiful new building. If you if you get a chance and, and they have time, get a tour. <clears throat> the previous lab was downtown in one of the government buildings, and it was it was a room like a fifth the size of this one. And I don't I honestly I don't know how they got any work done in there because it was so tight. So if you want water quality, you want to know what the NPK, EC, pH, SAR, all of that, then, then that's a private lab. And Ward Labs down in Greeley can do that for you. Okay, let's take a break. Let's take about a 10 minute break. <laughs> yeah, this is, this the prairie is my passion, one of my passions and I can, 
I talk for three or four hours nonstop on the brick. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you can have nurse cameras on there. You can have. Yeah. 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 And he'll be so happy. My horses are only out for as long as it takes to clean this. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Let me turn them out. Let them run. Let them kick. Yep. You throw the feet out and they're back. Yep. <laughs> Shake that. It's okay. Yeah. The ones you're right. They just get it. Okay. And I don't want them out very often. So then I press it with my sheet. And they look like feet. So I just describe, you know, they look like tiny feet. Because they don't. Quite an exercise because they're really easy. Yes. After I had horses, I put a big round bit on it. And for them, and they would leave a hole in it. And then I'd have a sword. And I have one that will eat until he dies. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was starved as a baby. And so he just, he will eat. Don't go out with a ponytail that's loose like that. And it 
it had the, it had every perfect element to make it happen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so welcome back. And uh, it's offensive. This is this is another area that's kind of interesting out on the prairie. And good fences make good neighbors. And I have repaired a lot of fence and, and just I've sucked it up for years on fixing fences that my neighbors were my neighbors horses have broken the fence, but they accused my cattle. And it's like, well, it's kind of bent in towards my property, not the other way around. <laughs> so, so you just sort of suck it up sometimes and fix it on your own. It's sometimes it's better than uh, having a big fight, but the state actually has standards, construction standards. You know, they're the minimum construction standards for building a fence. So just so you know, there is a, a guidelines out there for doing that. And I've, uh, I have some fences that are very overbuilt. <laughs> so, but anyway, and there's also um, on state statute about cost share on fencing. And if you build a fence, you know, technically your property boundary person on the other side can cover half the costs. And it can, but that can get a little interesting. But there is a law out there that, that covers that. Dogs. So I have five dogs and two of them are there to guard my sheep. And the, the sheep guard dogs, livestock guardian dogs, does anyone have experience with like Great Pyrenees or kind of sort of Anatolians, Mar Maremas? I mean, the, the list is huge. They bark at night, they dig big holes, they roam. And I have to emphasize, I had one, one I have Turkish Akbash, and I had a male that dug basements. He didn't dig a hole, he dug basements. And I was constantly filling in basements. They, they like to roam, but they know their, but my dogs know their property boundary. But a lot of times people will move out to the county, get a dog, and then let the dog run loose. And that's never, ever a good thing. And so there is, again, a state statute on animals running at large, specifically dogs. And it goes public nuisance, notice, penalties, rules, and regulations, animal control districts, and officers. So a dog injuring or killing livestock may be killed by the owner of the livestock. And I've sadly, in, in over 22 years, I've had to kill three dogs. So I got in with my sheep. And my, my Akbash will go after that dog, but if my Akbash are out barking at a coyote, which is what they like to do, then, then I kind of have to deal with the dog in my corral. And so three times I had a dog in my corral. And, and it's never anything you want to do. Trust me, it, it's just not a pleasant thing to have to do. But if that dog is harassing or harrying or biting or injuring your animals, whether it's cows, sheep, goats, horses, your poultry, whatever. I mean, you have a right as that animal owner, that livestock owner to defend your livestock. And so this is the law that protects you on that. Now I've had my neighbors, I know some of my neighbor's dogs and they've come over to say hi and, and I know the dogs. And so I just load them up into my car and take them home. And yeah, that's, that's okay. So windbreaks, we talked a little bit about windbreaks in the site analysis class. If you live out on the prairie, you definitely want to consider a windbreak. So the conservation district will put it in for you. I highly recommend that you hire them to put it in. And because what they can do in two hours will take you two weeks and put a drip irrigation system on it. And, and don't underestimate how much water your windbreak needs. Those little tiny trees are just nothing more than 
like a, a stick in the ground. And they, they literally need to be watered every other day just because the wind dries them out if it's hot. And, and so they, they do need a lot of water for the first number of years that they're in there, but they're certainly worth the effort and the time. They do increase the value of your property. Yeah, anyone who knows has lived in town has dealt with the wind and you go, oh, I wanna go live out on the prairie and there's a windbreak there, you know, it's worth paying extra for a windbreak that's already installed. Done right, decreases your heating bills, pushes the wind up and over the house. Capture snow, reduces drifting on roads. Well, maybe. <laughs> so whoever put my, my windbreak in, put it in on a north east west axis. So it drifts incredibly to the south, but it also has a component where it drifts to the east and it buries the road. Maybe. Definitely increases soil moisture. And for a while, the conservation district was telling people to either plow under the grass or mow it. I'm going to tell you, leave the grass alone. Stop mowing in, in the windbreak. Just leave that windbreak grass alone. It helps catch the snow. It holds the snow. It banks the snow. And then it eventually falls over and creates a ground cover. Yes, it's competitive to the trees. But trees and grass have grown up together. And I, I don't see, I don't see the detriment anymore to having grass and trees together. It does provide very interesting wildlife habitat. I had a neighbor that was raising pheasants. And so for a while I had pheasants in my windbreak and very stupid birds. <laughs> uh, I have uh, all sorts of little creatures that live in my, my windbreak. Oh, weeds, tumbleweeds. That last year was just a, a great year for growing weeds, especially the Russian thistle. So they take, weeds are, are advantage takers. And so they'll, if it's kind of a wet spring and then it gets hot and dry, the weeds are off and running, especially the Russian thistle. They like disturbed soil. So the area that's been graded along the road, the gravel roads, or if you've done construction, um, they love that. Then they dry out and then they become a fire hazard. So, so weeds, better to have grass holding soil moisture in than having weeds because at some point weeds do become a fire hazard. And, and, and so, so weeds change the soil. A lot of weeds are what we call aliopathic. And so they actually produce a substance in the roots that acts as an herbicide to other grasses. And so they can kill out grasses and take over a site very quickly. Leafy spurge is one that does that. Toad flax is another. Cheat grass is another. So they, so the, the word is aliopathic, makes its own herbicide kind of in a simplified manner. And, and so it doesn't want any competition. So it kills off the competition. Some of them can actually increase the salt in the soil. They change the water table deaths. They can increase erosion, wildfire. And, and so some of them are pretty amazing. So this one, county brome, cheap grass. It's a winter annual. And so a lot of research has been done on this it will germinate at 46 degrees. So it will start germinating in November, a little bit of moisture, cool. <clears throat> we had a warm fall. So I suspect a lot of it's gonna germinate this spring if we have enough moisture and it's cool enough. So it'll start to grow again. It grows very quickly. It starts off kind of a, uh, a looks more like a bunch grass and it can be kind of a reddish hue, maroon hue to it. And at that point, when it starts to grow, it's actually quite palatable for animals. And it has a fairly high protein content. So you can graze it. And I'll, I'll graze what's on my pastures, um, use my sheep to graze it. So it's quite palatable at that point. But come about June, it turns another color. It turns kind of a red. And that's when it's going to seed. And at that point, it is not palatable. And the animals won't touch it. And if they do start to graze it, it has an 
it has an awl on it. So it has kind of a little pointy, I'm trying to use the markers that were given to me. Kind of has like this little pointy thing. There's your C and there's the awls that come up on it. So if an animal eats this, like a horse, horses especially, they can get it packed in into their mouth. So the horse people in here are going, yeah, yeah. that's a vet bill. So, so when you start getting livestock, you're out on the prairie and you get livestock, you start looking at things and going, oh, that'll be a vet bill. I better get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And it only takes a couple of vet bills for you to really get it, get attuned to, oh, that's a vet bill. Mm -hmm. It, and um, dogs, um, it can get stuck into their coats, especially in the chest area. And so then you got to start combing them out or pulling it out. And that's, I have, um, in addition to the Akbash, I've got corgis. They have four inch little legs. They're like little vacuums out there running through the cheatgrass. And so I have to roll them over and, and comb it out or pull it out of their chest. They do not like that. Period. They do not like it. This also, when it, it will catch on fire, this is a, definitely a very fire hazard grass because it dries out in June. So this is one that if it burns, and I've had people burn it on purpose, I'm going to burn it out. The first grass that comes back is going to be cheat grass. The seed bank is just horrific. And there's, a, there's an area that UW is studying up in Seibel Canyon, and that's the canyon that it's a shortcut between Wheatland and Laramie. Really pretty. If you ever get a chance to drive that route, really, really pretty. And they've been checking, they've been doing monitoring it, doing research up there, but they figure there's a 20-year seed bank of cheatgrass up there. And so that, that seed is very, very long-lived. You have to go after the seed, you have to go after the plant either in the fall and in, uh, in the late October, November, or in this early spring, there's very few herbicides that you can put down. Plateau is one that you can use. It works pretty well. There's, when it comes to any sort of chemical, you know, the label is law, you've got to read that label. It's like a little book for Plateau. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. I do use plateau out there to control my cheatgrass because I want desirable forage out there for my animals. Cheatgrass is not desirable. Um, when we found at the park that if you spray that right before rain, yeah, twelve hours before rain, it's really before rain. Okay. And otherwise, they can once you get the seeds, you got to bag them. Yeah, you know, pull, pull them, bag them. Yep. I've done that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it this is this is another one that's gonna give you a whole new chore. I see it in town, I see it in the alleyways, I see it downtown. <laughs> it it shows up, it's a survivor and it will show up just about any place. So UW uh, grad student did some research on it. Because a lot of times it's also in wildflower seed mixes, and so his premise was, well, if I get, if I if I wet everything down, keep it at forty six degrees, I get the cheat grass to germinate, but the wildflower seeds won't germinate because it's too cold for them. Then I can get rid of the cheat grass. So he did that. Took the took the dried the seed skin, and this is where cheat grass is really lives up to its name because it, it, it cheats the system. And it's figured out how to work the system to its advantage. And after he dried it out, now technically once a seed germinates, it should not ever be able to germinate again, but guess what, cheatgrass can do that. Cheatgrass can germinate twice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a very tough one to control. There's not a lot of controls that work well with it. They have, up in the state of Washington, they're doing some experiments with um, a bacteria called Pseudomonas speciosa. And they found that they can, they can alter 
the soil microbiology and make it more bacteria than fungal. And cheatgrass likes a more fungal soil. It takes about three or four years to change that soil microbiology. But the tricky thing with this biological control is that the pseudomonas is a living creature. It gets shipped to you. You can put it in the refrigerator, but you can only apply it when it's cool, cloudy, and there's some moisture happening. Timing is everything. Really rather grab the plateau. It's easy. <laughs> Try to find a day in the fall when it's cool, moist, and raining out. Good luck. <laughs> so they've had some success when they've been able to get the timing down, but the timing has just been really tricky with this. So cheatgrass is a huge problem. That's it is literally on every continent in the world. Every <clears throat> continent in the world. Russia. Yeah. From Russia with love. There's a few others from Russia with love. Yeah. Field bindweed. I have seen bindweed <laughs> over by the Cheyenne Alliance Church push up through the asphalt road over there and growing from one side of the church under the asphalt, popping up through the asphalt and coming over into the housing subdivision on the other side of the road. Think of a bowl of spaghetti. And that's what the root system looks like for bindweed. And that's what makes it so hard to control is because that, that root system is so huge, that biomass underground is so huge and so daunting that it's, it's really hard for any chemical to truly take it out. And so it comes down to persistence. So if you find bindweed and before it gets to go to seed, you can graze it. When I had horses, my horses loved to eat it. But once it goes to seed, then your horse becomes just a spreader. My goats would eat it. My sheep will eat it. I pull it. I use Roundup on it but it's persistence. So there is no one chemical that's gonna work on it other than just your persistence. Charles, did you find anything when you were working in Southeast Colorado? More persistence than I am. Yeah. Uh, if you do spray it with Roundup in the fall when it's kind of like getting that energy to the root system is the best time to get it, but it's still, I, I could never control it in my garden. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So pulling it, persistence is, I don't have a good answer for anybody. And no one likes my answers, but that, that's kind of the way it goes. It's a biological looking at it. We tried it, but it sucks because yeah. Yeah, there is a. Like a, yeah, good, good bug. Yeah, there. Yeah, we, I would love to think that those little bugs work, but they just. It's like trying to control thistle with bugs or toad flax with bugs. It's just a really long marathon. It is a marathon. So, so this lovely plant here, again, I've spotted it growing just about every place in Laramie County, including downtown in the planter at the Elks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. What is this one? This is Dalmatian toad flax. And this is a Eurasia weed. And it doesn't really have any anything that will eat it or eat eat it one way or the other. I I've heard of horses that will go out and eat the flower heads off of it, and that's and that's fine. And bumblebees love this. Honeybees don't because this flower is a snapdragon. It's a really pretty flower. Yeah, it's a pretty yellow snapdragon looking flower. It gets about this tall and it's got a, an amazing root system that is 
is not only a taproot type system, but it's rhizomatous. I have had good luck pull hand pulling it. I've had really good luck hand pulling it. But the bumblebees can take advantage of this, but honeybees can't. So it's it's not really a good, and it's, the native bees are too small to take advantage of it either. It's one plant, one plant can produce about a quarter million to half a million seeds, depending upon the seed size. Trying to control this one is also really, timing is, is really important because weeds have such a different physiology than or domesticated plants do. <clears throat> so this is another one that you have to spray in the fall. And it's right up there with thistle. You spray it in the fall and like Charles said, takes the, the herbicide and translocates it down into its root. So it takes, takes what you just sprayed on its leaves. It takes that up osmotically. So through the stoma cells and takes it down and stores it in its roots. And so you do it right after the first frost. And so the plant goes, oh, I better get ready for winter. And so you go, yeah, here's something extra for you to have for winter. Take this herbicide and die. And, and so fall is the best time to go after these guys, your thistle and, and your toad flax. And there's a few others that, that work well with fall application. What I run into is a lot of people try to control these in the summer. And come summer, they're pretty much herbicide resistant. So if you're spraying your thistle or whatever other bad guys in your yard in the summer, you're wasting your time and resources. And if you don't have a lot of them, you can go out there and cut, well, cut, cut it back yep. and bag it before it goes to seed. Yep. Yep, once a month or something like that. That's what you do with that thistle too is yep. mow it or, or cut it before it goes to before it goes to before seed. it goes to seed is the key. Yeah. Yeah. And then the fall hit it with the yep. yep. I've um I hand pull it. And and even though it's got this extensive root system, it really just seems to be set back and just really damaged by pulling it. And I don't ever get the whole thing. And I know there's this biomass underneath there, but I've never had it come back. And, and I keep track of where I find toad flax on my property. What do you do with it after you pour it? Do you burn it? Um, I've burned it. I've bagged it. It depends upon my level of motivation. Sometimes I just bag it and put it in the trash. Other times it's like, it's like, I use scurvy dog and I burn it, you know? So yeah, it just depends upon where my temperament and my motivation is. But um and, and the other one is the yellow toad flax. And I I don't I mean I can tell them apart, but I don't just discriminate against either one. I out of a pull of a very so they also they're also doing research on the toad flax out here at the high plains. And they've discovered that Dalmatian and yellow toad flax are crossing. And it's creating a super weed that's, <laughs> yeah, that's resistant. And, and that's just really, I mean, that's just scary. And there are weevils that you can buy. There's stem weevils. And Montana, the insectary up in Montana has these stem weevils. And so you can buy a biological insect control method but it's, again, timing is everything. And, and if you've got toad flax on your property, you should have ordered them last fall. They might still have some available. I mean, they just sell out. And they, they do work, but over time they work. And, and I, I will crawl into my neighbor's pasture and pull toad flax. And I, and I let everybody know, it's like, you see me out there, I'm pulling weeds for you. And they're, they're like, go for it. <laughs> but Horses will eat the tops off of that. And it doesn't seem to cause them any problems. The plant is otherwise um, somewhat toxic. It's got alkaloids in it. And so alkaloids almost always go after the river. So you don't ever want an animal to eat a lot of that stuff. Leafy spurge. I, leafy spurge is um, out on Effie Warren. And it does follow Crow Creek for a little ways, but um, the city has been able to keep it under control pretty well. It's not huge 
problem. There are more problems with it to the north and northwest. And this is another one that's just really, really hard to control. And, and again, it's very, very aggressive. It's deep rooted. It reproduces not only by the seeds, but by creeping along. And once it, once it takes over a field, really, really hard to control it. They do use goats to eat it. And they've tried for years to put grass seed back in there to get the grass to be, try to outcompete it. If you're gonna put grass down to try to outcompete any of these weeds, um, pubescent wheat grass and crested wheat, those two are the ones that seem to outcompete them. And so they've been doing some research on that up at Lingle, which is a UW research station. And they spent a couple years doing research on, on cheap grass control and spurge control. And they've tried everything, grazing, not grazing, mowing, herbicides. Yeah. So they got all these research guys out there and from different counties coming into up to Lingle, which is up by Torrington to do all the, you know, what works best? Can we graze it and then spray it and then intercede it? Or can we do this and this? Well, the, the farm manager out there had a test plot too. And the farm manager walked in and sprayed the whole thing with Roundup and then reseeded with intermediate wheat. And he won the contest. <laughs> so, so, so these guys, the leafy spurge is a problem. Cheatgrass is a, is a huge, huge problem. In South and North, excuse me, Northeast Colorado, Julesburg, Sterling area, huge, thousands, thousands of acres of cheatgrass. Caught on fire, burned everything down, and a few buildings in there, nothing for the animals to graze. And what came back? Cheatgrass. <laughs> oh, it changed the ecosystem hugely, huge changer. Russian thistle, this is tumbleweed. And this last year was just, a bumper crop here for Russian thistle. And, and I have it on my property and it just makes me crazy. So I, I'm gonna have to go out and spray for it. But it's little flowers with thorns, although it is um, for native bees, they seem to be okay with it, with uh, taking advantage of this. But the seeds are held in these little seed pods. And so as this rolls and tumbles across the landscape, it's dispersing its seeds. Then it gets stuck in your fence and it can be, it can pull a fence down. And for a while, the county would go out along the fence line and mow it. It had a special piece of equipment that pulled it away from the fence. And then behind the guy that had the special piece of equipment pulling it away from the fence, they were mowing it. There was a huge mat along the fences of Russian thistle, yeah. And when this stuff catches on fire, wow, it's spectacular because it's, it's, it just explodes. Okay. Yep, it's an annual. So the little babies look like grass. They, they're like little leathery grasses. And you can go out and when you find them, pull them. They're, they're pretty, you know, if you look at it close enough, you're going to go, well, that's not a grass. That's just got, and it's, it's a kind of a serrated blade leaf. It's bumpy. It's rough. It's really weird. Leathery. So when you touch it, you know it's not grass. Yep. Okay, Larkspur. Pretty blue flower, native. Hard not to like this plant, especially if you're in town and you've got a cultivated garden and you want to put this native in there, by all means, go for it. However, out on the prairie, it's toxic. And it's every part of this is toxic. The stem, the leaves, the flower, it's toxic. So this is not, um, don't ever put it in your salad, okay? <laughs> it's not garnish. It's, um, it's extremely toxic to cattle. I mean, extremely. 
And it only takes about a fourth of a pound of Larkspur <coughs> to kill a 1200 pound cow. And it'll do it within 36 to 48 hours. And it's, I mean, it's highly palatable, right? just highly palatable. There is no antidote for Larkspur. And I had found a number of years ago, I had a guy, the guy called me, he wasn't familiar with the area. He threw his cattle out on pasture. This stuff likes to start blooming May, June, I don't know later than that, June, July, June, July. And, and I mean, he had, he had like 30 cattle dead. And he's on the phone with me going, what is going on? I don't know what they're eating. And I'm like, Larkspur. I said, the only thing that can do that that fast is Larkspur. And then had someone else new to the, the land. Big, big, beautiful prairie palace house. Beautiful, I and mean, everything's just gorgeous. And so he had Corenti cattle. And so Corenti cattle are the ones with the big horns on them. Not long horns, but they're used for roping. And so most people lease them. They don't buy them. They just lease them. Well, he threw them out in the whole field full of larkspur. And I'm on my way home and I stop and I drive up his driveway and I'm banging on his door and pull out my business card. <laughs> this is who I am. You know, don't shoot me. This is who I am. And I said, you're, you're Corinthian cattle out there in Larkspur. And he's, he's looking at me going, yeah. Cool. And I told him, I said, this is only going to take a few plants to kill them. I said, those are on lease, aren't they? You're going to have to replace them. And he's like, it's going to kill them. And I said, it's going to kill them in about 36 hours. He said, you need to get your kids out there and pull the larkspur and move those cattle out of there. Then I had an, another yard call. And again, he, a lot of people don't know how to identify larkspur or what it is. They just hear about it. And so this is way up north. It was almost in like another county. Drive up to his property, drive up to his house, standing on the hill. And he's going, I understand larkspur is toxic to cattle. Could you point the larkspur out to me? And his whole prairie was just glowing blue with larkspur. <clears throat> so I find it on my property and I, I hand pull it. I just hand pull it. And that seems to be a fairly easy control for it. It is native. So if you like to have the native plants and you don't have animals, by all means, it's okay to have it. Horses can tolerate it. Sheep, goats can tolerate it. I think a goat can eat anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I had a goat eat, uh, eat a tarp once. And then I had another goat eat the duct tape off a bumper on my husband's, one of my husband's cars. I mean, they're just strange animals. Mm -hmm. They are tasty though, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, horse English man to eat a dish towel. That's about as close as I can get to that. <laughs> and it definitely came out the other side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we we can swap stories. Yeah, oh yeah, we go all day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so horses, it'll give them a belly ache. I, I, I haven't had sheep problems with it, but, but the cattle, it's absolutely lethal. Beautiful flower, native. Who knew? Okay, Forbes. Forbes is a kind of a range management way of saying weeds and wildflowers. And I get people calling me about prickly pear cactus and the hedgehog cactus. So out on the prairie, there's, there's a number of different types of cactus, including we have barrel cactus up here, which is really kind of cool. But we have another kind of, um, I call them hedgehogs. And they're, they're kind of a round little thing and they're very spiny. And if you step on it, it'll spring up and it'll, it'll attach into your cat. <laughs> And so I recommend carrying, you know, walking around on the prairie, I carry a Leatherman with me so I can pull it out. 
and my dogs will step on it and I'll pull it off of them. Horses, oh my gosh, my neighbor's horses, I crawled into their pasture one day and, and pulled hedgehogs off of them. Um, so I get people calling and say, well, how can I get rid of these? You know, what herbicide will kill them? No, none, none. Don't even try with an herbicide because they're just, even if you kill it with an herbicide, it, the little carcass is still there with all the thorns. So I tell people and they don't, and trust me, people don't want to hear this. You take a barbecue tongs, those long barbecue tongs and a bucket and you walk around on your prairie and you look for these and you take your barbecue tongs and you grab them with the tongs and you put them in the bucket. And I get a lot of pushback on that. It's like, walk your prairie, you know, get to know what's out there. It's, there's a lot of beautiful things. Scarlet globe mallow. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful orange. It's, it's worth walking out there. And so I have a, um, on both the Master Gardener and the Extension Office website, I should have some pictures of prairie flowers out there. And, and there's some stuff that's just absolutely gorgeous. And then there's some things out there, there's some daisies out there, um, Woodman's <coughs> daisy that grows in soils that have high selenium content. And I actually have a little pocket out there of these woodsman dare, um, daisies. And so I know that there's an area that's got high selenium. Fortunately, my animals kind of avoid it. Don't eat that. Prickly pear, guys, we know what that is. Beautiful flowers, just beautiful yellow flower on them. Um, Scarlet globe mantle, nice orange flower on these guys. Fringe sage. So, um, I'll get people that'll call and complain about fringed sage artemisia. This is a plant that's an indicator. And when someone says, how do I get rid of the fringe sage? The first thing I'll tell them is, are you mowing your prairie or are you grazing it hard? Because this is an indicator and this is a, a colonizer plant that will move in and try to help hold the soil and help other plants get going. And so if someone tells me they've got that, I'll start asking them those questions. And it's like, you got to get the horses off and you got to stop mowing. And then you will get, and then this will eventually go away. But it will take years. Because when you start having nothing but fringe sage, that, that's again, that's a real uphill battle. It's native. It belongs here. Um, hooded flox. And there's a pile of snow around it. So you got to go look for it early. Um, April, late April, early May. Beautiful little hour. Okay, so last year we had like, last couple of years we have had a population explosion of these guys. Rabbits. We have um, these guys, we have, these are the damage they cause. Yeah, you don't want to find that on your tree. And <laughs> domestic dogs. So I, I must have 20 rabbits on my property. And, and they're in my windbreak. They're predominantly in my windbreak. They're along the buildings. The corgis try to chase them. The Akbash chases them. And they've chased them so much that the it's kind of this half-hearted attempt. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll give it kind of honorable mention and I'll kind of... So I say maybe on the dogs. I've got a neighbor who has jackrabbits, the big pairs. They have, they have Jack Russell Terriers. And even the Jack Russell Terriers look at it and go, what's the point? <laughs> so these work best for protecting your trees because I guarantee you the rabbits will try to eat the bark off your trees, both the cottontails and the jackrabbits. So a hare, big long ears, big long ears. And when they run, they, they, they kind of stand up on those back legs and they just are sprinters. They go. Yeah. Um, so with both of these, Again, it goes back to my soapbox. If you want rabbits, mow your property because they all these animals, these the brown squirrels, the 13 stripers, the rabbits, they want to have a clear view. 
They want to be able to look out over the prairie so that they can see that fox, that coyote, that hawk, the owl, so they can see the predator coming at them. They want that clear view. If you want to control these guys and you don't want rabbits and the, all those other critters, don't mow. Let that grass get tall. Because if they can't see the predator coming, they're going to move to someone else's property, preferably someone's that has mowed. <laughs> And if you ever get a chance to drive up Whitney North, you can see where someone has mowed their prairie to death and they have just nothing but prairie dogs, just nothing but prairie dogs. And the neighbors who don't mow have no rodents. They don't have any problems. So again, these guys, prairie dogs, I'm, I'm not a big fan, they're native. They have their place in the ecology um, Black-footed ferrets like to live in their holes. Um, there's a pygmy owl that likes to live in the holes, a ground nesting, burrowing owl. And so there are, they do support other wildlife, but you're also going to find rattlesnakes down in there and black widow spiders and funnel spiders. And those funnel spiders are those ones that build that nest, that, that funnel, that's their name, funnel spiders. Their, their bite is actually pretty toxic. They're not up there with a black little spider, but they're pretty toxic. So a lot of these spiders, some of them get a bad rap for being venomous, but what's actually happening is that on their fangs, they have a lot of bacteria and that bacteria is what's gonna make you sick. So prairie dogs, again, they want that clear view. So if you ever see a prairie dog area, notice that there's no tall grass. The prairie dogs have eliminated that tall grass and you'll see a lot more bindweed growing in that area and a lot more <coughs> um, buffalo grass and blue grandma grasses growing in that area because they, they've gotten rid of all of it. And so not mowing or not overgrazing is how you control these. Guys. And there are some really interesting things on the internet on how to get rid of prairie dogs. <laughs> Um, we have state property behind our uh, 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 house, uh, it's the state property there on East Four Mile, mm -hmm. and the prairie dog moved in last year. At least that was the first time I noticed that hills and their community down there. How do we stop them from moving? And high our house. Don't mow. Don't mow. Well, no, we only mowed once last year. And that's that's the problem I have with that whole area there, four mile and and um riding club is no more on hills. That's it. Um the worst thing you can do is mow a hill because the hills can't support anything. And so the water runs off, the hotter, the drier, year round, the hotter and drier, don't mow. And so the neighbors like to mow up there, they mow a lot. And that's what's going to bring them in. If you can talk to your neighbors about not mowing, good luck. Um, because for them, it's recreation. <laughs> Both of our neighbors have got trees and they don't really love it. So thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid of who did on the map. Yeah, it's in the state's not going to do anything about it. But if it's being grazed, that's part of the problem. And usually, it's only grazed for a few weeks a year. Yeah, the state's pretty careful about grazing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gets entertaining. Exodus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's entertaining. I, mean, I, can... <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> the yeah. county health department does monitor several very dog colonies around the state. Yeah. Because that population um, is what's going to give that first indication of bubonic plague in the fall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's scary. So, prairie dogs carry fleas, and the fleas have that blue carry bubonic plague. Mm -hmm. And you don't ever want to. Pack goes out and catches prairie dog, kills prairie dog, brings it in. Your cat, you let the cat in the house. And the flea bites you. Yep, yep. Oh, I've watched people walk their dogs through prairie dog towns. And and that's just that's just mortifying. It, it's oh my gosh. 
Really? Aren't the, aren't the three pieces they're still going to jump on a dead body? Right. Or, or if the, like a cat or a dog gets manages to get one and brings it back into the house. I mean, I had a cat that would catch pigeons, pigeons, and try to bring them into the house. I was like, oh, <laughs> you draw the line, right? Draw the line. Mm. Um, yeah, from, from Lori, um, tularemia, that's another, that's another scary one. Um, that's from rabbits. Yeah. And yeah, they, they carry things with them. You don't want yeah well further west further north yeah they had some outbreaks of that in torrington for a while and in wheatland but it's not, it's fortunately it's not come here yeah i know yeah i've had long conversations with wanda manley who worked up at the lab i have a i have a whole respect for <laughs> microbiology yeah right is this um this, this rabbit too is that a different disease that shows up over here that looks like a rainbow? No, this is a, another bacteria. Does it just and, kill them? Or, or what is it exactly? Wow. I, I don't think it I don't think it necessarily kills them. Um what I remember is the problem is when you go on rabbit hunting and you're feeding the rabbit mm -hmm. and somehow it gets into the bit of heavy food. Okay. They had something like that in the last uh, video. Yeah. I was wondering if it was that or if it was the other disease that shows up like on rabbit meat. But I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. You have to be careful with the animal. Because yeah. Because I think it's another parasite that lives on yeah, that animal. Yeah. And, yeah. And, the, and the trick is, you know, getting the right diagnosis to get the right antibiotics. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the other tricky thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they don't. So prairie dogs don't hibernate. They're active all year round. And yep. Pocket gophers. Oh, these will make you crazy. And there's really no good way to control them. They don't hibernate. They're nocturnal and diurnal. So they're, they're 24 hour. They live in the ground. They're, they're little they're you know, maybe about the size of that. So after the snow melts, this is what's left behind. So those tunnels, this is what it looks like in the summer. So they've got the mounds. Now I've had pocket gophers in my high tunnel and you know, which, you know, was like, not very happy about it. And then I realized how much soil they were actually rototilling. And I'm like, well, I'll let you live for a little longer. <laughs> but this is what they'll do to a tree. And so they'll get into a, a windbreak tree row. And just about the time you think your trees are doing great and they're growing and they're wonderful. And all of a sudden, it starts to lean over and it starts to fall. And you walk up to it and you pull it out of the ground. And all that's left is that little no, they literally will they'll eat all the roots off of that, that tree and they like ponderosas especially. Yeah, so very frustrating. So they like moist, cool, moist soil. And so they're a bane in alfalfa fields, windrows. And so the trick with trying to control that is to keep your irrigation on top of the weed barrier and just keep it right at the tree and not try to irrigate the whole long line. But they're hard to control. And I've had cats bring them in. I've had, I have a lot of hawks that hunt them. You can use um, alfalfa growers will use what's called a gopher getter. <laughs> and so it's, it runs kind of a, a trench, underground trench tunnel 
and then it drops poison pellets along the way because a pocket gopher will go to another trench and it'll eat these pellets. Not optimal, but that's kind of how it works. I had, I had a cat, a barn cat, that just was amazing at catching pocket gophers, just amazing. Brown squirrels, these are little 13 stripers. And then this is the Wyoming ground squirrel, which I get a lot of calls on how to control. And so the first thing out of my mouth is going to be, they like clear open vistas. They like very short mowed or overgrazed prairies. How are you managing your prairie? And if someone tells me I'm mowing it, it's gonna be stop mowing. And so we'll talk about it and then like every other sentence is stop mowing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what their hole looks like on the Wyoming ground squirrels and the Richardson, the 13 stripers. <laughs> don't mow, don't mow. Plant more flowers, water more. <laughs> and uh, foxes, I have chickens, but I, my chickens roost at night so they're, and they're protected by my dogs. But the foxes and the coyotes, and we have weasels out here, which that's, that's another story. But this is gonna be your best control overall for controlling your rabbits, your ground squirrels, your prairie dogs, all those critters is, is the fox and the coyote. Those are your good guys. And a coyote and the fox will actually go out, they'll eat grasshoppers, they'll eat snakes. They'll go after a lot of stuff. They are great biological control. Those are are your best friends out there on the prairie. Just put your chickens up at night. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's my that's my prairie ecology story. And uh, living out on the prairie is a lot of fun. I enjoy it. That is my happy place for sure. But it is a delicate ecosystem. And then, um, you know, I passed around that, that paper on the harvester ants that build those volcano mounds. They're part of the ecology. They belong out there. And sometimes they, you know, they're not in the right place sometimes. And they're, they're actually pretty easy to get rid of. So between, I use some. Um, those cinnamon red hots. A cinnamon in high concentration is a cinnamon formaldehyde. And you can kill ants with it, with high concentration of cinnamon and then aspartame. <laughs> or diet coke on it. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. I, I mean, it changes your whole perspective on, on some of these foods. I know a guy who loves and then pours it into the ant hole and like pulls out, you know, you treat and like oh. sell them. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That, that, some of that artwork is phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. So with the, with those of us in the county who are on well water, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I'm really deep tapping into the Ogallala aquifer. Is the fracking affecting that at all? Okay. Um, yes. Yes. That's pretty scary. It's very scary. They'll compare fracking to agriculture and they'll go, fracking uses less water than agriculture. And it's like, if you want to see me get on my, my soapbox and my hair stand on there, well, that's all I have to hear is someone say, well, fracking uses less. Baloney. Fracking pulls water out of the ground 24 seven. It is a permanent loss of that water. You will never get that water back. They pump that water down 10,000, 14,000 feet underground. They estimate that it moves 10 feet a year. 10 feet a year is all it moves in, in Wyoming soils. You'll never see that. The, the aquifer never gets a chance to rest and recharge, which is granted agriculture does use a lot but we keep it in the hydrological cycle. So 
So that hydrological cycle means that the water comes out of the ground, we put it back on the ground, the plant uses it, the plant uses only so much, right? And then it, then it transpirates what it can't use. So it puts water back into the air, humidity back into the air. Some of it goes into the ground, some of it runs off, but it's, it stays in that cycle. We never pull it out. Fracking is a permanent pull out of water out of the hydrological cycle. And I really think because fracking is going on globally, I really think that's the reason why we're seeing climate change happen so fast. Is we don't know how much moisture is actually out there. We don't know how much water, but we're, but we're pulling it out and we're putting it deeper. And so it's never going to see the light of day in. Where is Wyoming? Are they fracking right now? Oh, where aren't they? Well, no, I, that's a tertiary recovery. Right now, tertiary recovery is it's really possible. They're, so they're all up in Casper and all that area has virtually shut down. Yeah. Now they own the water rights because they're very smart. They can not buy the water. Yeah. But fracking is only, only profitable when oil prices is high and they're not. They're fracking here in Laramie County. In Laramie County, they're yeah. they're yeah. actually doing it. Not have the permit for, but actually doing it. Yes. So all basically all of the oil and gas that can be extracted without fracking has already been extracted, like in the whole country. So now yeah. it is fracking. Like that's yep. what's left. Yep. Well, no, that's not. No, not all of it needs to be fracked. I mean, down. In, in Texas, you can do tertiary recovery without the frack. The so frack is a problem everywhere. That's for sure. But most of it has stopped, comes with it, has stopped doing it. It's both like, So, the largest than the chemical contamination of the Oh, yeah. That's, and that's a huge issue too. I, I don't know, you know, if I had Jeremy Manley in here, who's with us, the state engineer's office, he could tell you more about that. I just know that it's, it's going it permanently out of the hydrological system, putting it so deep that it's not even going to cover it. A lot of the chemicals in there is soup. I have a neighbor not too far down the road from me that sells a lot of crackers. Those big tankers, um, each one of those tankers um, only pay this guy $66 per tanker load of water. It's like 6,000 gallons of water in there. Wow. And I've seen as many, I've seen as many as 10 tankers that day. Yeah. So it's a huge, huge pool of water, and the aqua never gets a chance to rest in There's a couple of them. Oh, are there? Ed Ferguson's not the only one. No, I'm not looking for that. This is a dense bear. This one. Oh, it's it's a money maker. And, but the consequences down the road are Vinegar, 20% horticulture vinegar, or even just regular vinegar. Take up. Like if you're talking like if you jerry just put like a picture like that in a sprayer. Yeah. Can you identify puncture vine before it goes to seed? 
Probably not. Okay. My husband might be able to. Because it's um is there a time of year where that typically happens? Well, it has those little flowers, right? Before you it, see it the has the little functions. tiny yellow flowers yeah. and it's got yeah. this fern like leaf to it. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna run up really quick. I um Jason said you needed my email. He, he emailed it to you. Okay. This, just right before class, so you probably haven't seen it. 